it might be useful to start with where things stand in the epidemic right now and how that poses challenges for managing the economy and managing the epidemic and the relationship between the two going forward. So as of today, or as of the data for today, which is yesterday, uh, so as of today, June 17th, uh, you can see that cases, for COVID cases and deaths have been declining very significantly for quite a while in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. In the rest of the United States, not so much. So there's declining deaths, but in fact, cases, detect confirmed cases have been going up. Part of that is because of testing, but if you squint here and you look right at the tail, this is concerns about the reopenings that have occurred in May, and then perhaps, uh, perhaps we're seeing just the beginning of some of the uh, results of the uh, widespread protests, although it might be a little bit too early to tell. But what this, especially this chart on the right-hand side raises is significant questions about what reopening policies should look like so that we are able to maintain deaths going down while getting people back to work, and also uh, what might the, be the appropriate policies in case we see a second wave. So that's what this paper tries to do. This paper aims at looking at uh, informing reopening policy choices uh, part of one of the questions that we wanted to answer is whether a nuanced sectoral approach can promote uh, economic recovery while keeping control of the epidemic. And the key epidemic parameter here is R, the basic reproductive rate, and keeping that below one. Uh, a second question is uh, a second question is how do these interact with um, non-economic NPIs? N NPIs being non-pharmaceutical interventions. What's the interaction between non-pharmaceutical interventions and economic reopening? Generally speaking, in the popular press, or if you listen to the news, as we all do, there's a, almost a synonym between reopening and economic reopening. And I think one of the messages coming out of this modeling is that that's actually not correct. Um, there's questions about how uh, reopening and subsequent closing goes according to some of these roadmaps that have been put out. But I think importantly, in terms of ongoing work, and I'll give a, an in, some, some high, uh, advanced views that go beyond the working paper of this ongoing work later in the, uh, at the end of the talk, which is what are the policy options that we're facing for a second wave? What are different choices and what are the interplay between these various features? So we're gonna analyze this using a 66 sector economic model uh, combined with a five age epidemiological model. Let me pause on both of those. Sectoral economic model, that's important because as we know, the sectoral effects of the shutdown have been very different. There's a fair amount of lawyers working, but not so many restaurant workers working. So that's a, there's a big sectoral variation. A lot of that is related to personal proximity or risk exposure among the workers at work and among from between the customers and the workers. The um, epidemiological model that we're going to uh, meet this with is uh, an extension of a standard SI and now standard, uh, something that we all understand in economics now, an SIR model. This one's extended to have a quarantine component, and most importantly, it's extended to have five different ages. And the, the age structure is actually quite important because it allows us to look at um, important, important NPIs, like what if you, in fact, as we did, close um, elementary and secondary schools. Uh, the oldest people, 75 plus, especially those in nursing homes, are the most vulnerable, so we want to be able to uh, uh, model those separately. Uh, and then there's actually a lot of age variability among uh, workers in different uh, sectors. So a lot of restaurant workers are younger, a lot of workers in certain manufacturing areas are older. That puts, that means there's different risk profiles and getting some of those nuances right uh, is something that we're, uh, something we want to do. Um, the next piece that we uh, have here is um, having time varying specification of non pharmaceutical interventions. Uh, and I'll describe that. Let me describe that briefly right now. So, um, non pharmaceutical interventions, I'm going to interpret that broadly as a combination of mandatory shutdowns, such as closing school. If school is closed, you can't go to school. On the other hand, there's a large amount of evidence, an increasing amount of evidence, that, um, that part of the, much of the shutdown was actually due to voluntary behavior in anticipation of, either in anticipation of actual shutdown mandates or even more to the point, just self protective behavior. You stop going to restaurants and you stop flying because you're worried about that. There's quite good papers on that now, uh, including some at an upcoming Brookings conference uh, next week. 
Um, so we're going to have a model of a model of these time varying uh, specific time varying uh, non pharmaceutical interventions. And then finally, we're going to put this all together by having a governor who follows the CDC guidelines. Now, I'm going to talk about this exclusively as a governor, but 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 you don't need to think about it just as a governor. Actually, it's some so you can think about this as a representative agent solving some uh, uh, problem decision making problem and uh, and open and guiding their own behavior in terms of going back to work or going back to doing other activities. Uh, but I'm going to talk about it as a governor who is able to actually uh, set mandates. There's a very large literature uh, on this uh, using uh, related models now, which is a great sign of all of the excitement that's uh, happening in this area, uh, the seriousness with which people are taking, uh, taking this, and the fact that they're putting it all through the NBER. Okay, so the part of this is going to be the least familiar, perhaps, is the age-based contact uh, model, age-based uh, SEIQRD model. So I'm going to spend a minute on that. The core element of the contact uh, of this of this model is having contact matrices. The contact matrices represent different age groups. Uh, so we have uh, younger work, younger people, 20 and under, uh, younger younger working age, older working age, and then we have two older compartments: one 65 to 65 to 74, and then one 75 plus. And these, these, th this allows direct manipulation of the contacts uh, and the interactions that individuals have as we do things like shut down work and shut down, um, shut down, shut down sectors and shut down non-economic activity uh, as well. So for example, no longer being able to go to play bingo or, or whatever the non-economic activity is. So um, the, the left side uh, of this, uh, of this um, chart shows a normal contact matrix under normal circumstances. This is what we estimate the full shutdown contact matrix to look like. So there's a lot fewer contacts. You still see contacts along the diagonal because you live at home. This would be interactions, say, with your spouse. If you're in a full lockdown situation, here's interactions with, um, with uh, children to children. This would be interactions between uh, 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 parents and adult, uh, parents and children and so forth. Um, and then we can imagine uh, doing various uh, permutations, which is, say, just having the young uh, go back to work. This structure allows us, I'm not going to go through the math, but this structure allows us to compute uh, something that we refer to as a industry a risk to a GDP to risk index. And that asks the question of what happens uh, if you uh, add a worker to a sector, so a worker of age A to sector I, what's the effect of that on the overall log level of GDP? So what's the growth effect on GDP of adding work of a worker of age A to sector I, and how does that compare to the marginal effect on R0 of adding that worker? Adding that worker means that that worker is going to have more contacts, possibly having more risks, so there's going to be some effect on the overall progress of the epidemic. What the ratio of these is a ratio of the marginal risk, the marginal benefits to the marginal risks, and we refer to that as the uh, GDP to risk index. So one of the things we can look at in this structure is the question of what are the what's the value of a nuanced reopening. I will say that after all of this work, it's a little disappointing because our conclusion is that yes, a nuanced reopening can make a difference, but it turns out not to be that much of a difference. So it might add one percent to, or what we might add a, a fraction of a percent or half a percent to the level of GDP in terms of how quickly you can go there for a certain number of deaths. I think in our normal times, adding half a percent to GDP by a simple policy would be a great thing. In these circumstances, that's a uh, still a relatively small number compared to some of the other interventions that we'll be looking at. Here's an example of some simulations. So uh, what we look at on the left here is we have a, so we model the governor as being fairly conservative in this case in the sense of wanting to have a slow reopening and putting a priority on deaths uh, and making sure that those deaths are declining. And as those deaths decline, then the governor is going to be able to follow CDC guidelines. One of the gating criteria is that cases are declining, deaths are declining, and uh, hospital utilization is declining. And so by doing that, they're able to reopen different sectors, the restaurants can reopen, people will go back to work uh, uh, if, if they feel safe, and they'll feel safe if the deaths are declining. So that's the mechanism underlying the simulation at the left. 
All we've done on the right is we've had people stop doing non-work intervention. So non-work, we've stopped, if we slow down, if we relax, in addition, in addition to relaxing um, the economic restrictions, we relax non-work uh, non work NPIs, then all of a sudden those non work NPIs sort of, I guess one way to think about it is they suck all the oxygen out and, uh, and the contacts that you make in non work settings, going to church, going to play bingo, going to visit with friends, having birthday parties, those can over uh, those can result in a in this plateau. The, what the conservative governor does in response to seeing this plateau is basically slam on the brakes so that the reopening not only ends up at a much worse place in the end of in, in the end of December, but it but occurs much more slowly. So that we're looking at high levels of uh, of unemployment. I should mention that in these charts. This has not been updated. These charts. This predates the. Um, the May employment report. What we're looking at here is it is hours, uh, not uh, not actually uh, measures of uh, of numbers of people working. Let me wrap this up by giving some uh, highlights, looking at uh, what what we might think about for for openings according to uh, uh, reopenings. Uh, excuse me, not reopenings, but dealing with a potential second wave. So I'm going to look at a scenario where there's a reopening. Uh, occurring and it's following the CDC phase one, two, three guidelines on a timetable that's representative of the timetables that different states are using. Um, and what we're going to do at the same time as having those reopening, since those guidelines are across the board and they allow you to have group gatherings that go from say 20 to 30 and so forth, what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, you're going to have increased non-work contacts, both guests coming over to your home, birthday parties, also having social interactions at the, at, uh, the, at the Little League games and those sorts of things. And you're going to be more relaxed about not wearing masks. If you do that, and then we're going to say, well, what's going to happen? I'll just give uh, what's going to happen if we do that. But then perhaps if we see a second wave, what happens if you, in, uh, if you uh, open up, uh, but you're much more aggressive uh, on the economic side, but you reinstate the non-economic NPIs? Well, here's our opening up scenario. And what you see is uh, coming, this is based on new modeling. And so coming down to the deaths, this is the data through this morning. Uh, and you can see the deaths declining, and we're basically on track for uh, for the deaths declining. The governor and the, the individuals then relax their social distancing measure, and as they relax social distancing, deaths start to go up. The governor is then gets cold feet and doesn't allow the restaurants to open. The unemployment rate stays high. What if instead, what if instead, right here on July 15th, the governor had said, this is not the direction we want to be going, and I'm going to say no more going to church services, no more going to uh, Little League games, you've got to wear masks if you're in public and we're going to enforce it. What you see is that those non-economic NPIs have a massive effect in terms of uh, in terms of the overall death rate, and it enables the governor uh, to open up a lot of businesses, and because the death rates are going down, people are going to feel more comfortable going to work. This can be actually augmented. This is this is just using the masks and not having so as many social interactions outside of work. If you augment it with um, if you augment it with additional protections for nursing homes so you don't go to the lockdown that we had in april but instead you will have to, you could have testing uh and contact tracing for nursing home staff and residents and you could allow limited visitors under some protections that that path can be uh, even better because you're protecting the most vulnerable population and if you implement in a, on top of this some quarantine with uh, only a 10 percent effectiveness for the general population then you see that all of these things uh, taken together, all of which are non-economic, they're not shutting down airlines, they're not shutting down uh, restaurants, they're not shutting down non-economic activities. Uh, all of these make plenty of room for the economy actually to reopen and for people to get back to work. So let me just summarize this. The main lesson of these simulations, which was a surprise to me, is that, uh, frankly, I mean, basic, basic, the basic idea, the basic observation is that only about half of the interactions that people have are actually interactions at the workplace. And those are the ones where, um, where the contacts can be mitigated uh, to a considerable extent through uh, plexiglass or masks or spacing out desks. Um, so, so even making the workplace moderately safe, 
means that there's room for economic reopening, and uh, and that economic reopening is uh, is is can have uh, fairly limited effects in terms of the spread spread of the virus. The real issue is what happens in the non-economic uh, sphere. Do people wear masks? Do people go out and about without wearing masks? Uh, do they go to Fourth of July parades and that sort of thing? And so I think the real the main the main message here is the message is that reopening and reopening the economy are not in any sense synonyms. Now there's a lot of questions one can raise. I've modeled the governor as having this authority to tell people to go back to work. And of course, it's not like that. Factors, as I mentioned, a lot of literature suggesting that it's uh, voluntary, that a lot of the self-protective measures have been voluntary. You can tell people that they can't open a restaurant, but you can't force people to go to the restaurant once it reopens. And for that to happen, the diners have to be comfortable thinking that they're going to be having a safe experience and a pleasant experience. And for that to happen, you have to be on a, you have to be on a path that's like this, where the virus really is getting under control. And the way to get the virus under control is to have these non-economic, while opening up the economy, is to have these non-economic uh, NPIs in place in, a, in as vigorous a way as we possibly can.